like sunrise, hope dawns every morning in the hearts of men. For farm people, that hope lies in the fields and their crops. It is the hope that nature will be bounteous and that the everlasting cycle of plowing and planting, tilling and cropping and caring will be blessed by fine harvests. It is the hope that granaries and larders will be filled with the fruits of the earth and the goodness of the land. On some modern farms, like this one, that early morning hope may indeed come to pass. It may live and flourish. But in far too many rural communities, the hope for a bounteous farm life is tragically stillborn, and no midwife can give it breath or strength. In far too many agricultural communities, there is now death where there once was life, decay where there once was growth, blight where there once was health, and silence where there once was the sound of vitality. What juices have not dried are rapidly drying, and the land of milk and honey has been darkened by the shadow of low farm prices. For in spite of farmers' tremendous investment in land and equipment, in spite of their ever-increasing efficiency, farmers need a fair share price for their products, a price that lets them share equally with other segments of our economy with the manufacturer, the construction worker, the independent businessman. For without this fair share price, farm families will continue to leave their farms at the rate of 2,500 a week. The best talents of America's farm youth will continue to be siphoned off into urban industrial areas. And the sound of the auctioneer's gavel will continue to punctuate the quiet of rural America. Family farms will decay, and so will the small agricultural communities that depend upon them. The iron will rust, the wood will rot, and the souls of the men charged with providing for the wants of mankind will shrink and shrivel. The story of the farm problem in America can be told in pictures, but they are not pleasant pictures to see. They speak to us of the evil times that family farming has fallen upon throughout the land. And since wealth comes from the land, the farm problem needs immediate attention. Can hope dawn again for farm families? NFO thinks so. Listen. And so we look at the ugliness and blight attacking literally hundreds of smaller farming communities across the land as the exodus from the farm continues. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report. Last week on our show, we were concerned with the past and the present of American agriculture. This week, a look into the crystal ball, a look into the future of American agriculture. My guests again this week, a repeat performance for these two fine gentlemen, are on my left, Mr. Vince Rossiter. Mr. Rossiter is president of the Bank of Hardington in Hardington, Nebraska, a town located in the northeast corner of that state, population around 1,600. Mr. Rossiter is the author of numerous articles on the subject of the economy of rural America. He has been published numerous times nationally by the Independent Bankers Association, an organization of which he is a member. On my right is my other guest, Dr. E.W. Mueller. Dr. Mueller grew up on a farm in northern Iowa. After graduation from the seminary, he served as a pastor of a small rural church for about 12 years. Right after World War II, Dr. Mueller was appointed secretary of his church's town and country work, uh, a job he held for some 24 years. He is now serving in South Dakota as director for community organization and area development at Sioux Falls. Dr. Mueller is one of the most outstanding rural church leaders in the nation. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, this week, we have on my right a gentleman working with the spiritual and social values in rural America, 
and on my left, a gentleman working with the hard material side of the farm program, a preacher and a banker. I almost make you sound like the villain, Vince, you certainly do. and I certainly don't mean to at all. But uh, it's the truth. In the banking business, you do work with the hard, cold facts, don't right. you? That's correct. I think before, Doctor and Vince, we get into the future this week, it might be well, in as much as some of our viewers this week perhaps weren't watching us last, to sort of review and uh, talk for a moment about the status quo of American agriculture. So I would like for you, Vince, if you will, to comment on the status quo of uh, agriculture from the economic standpoint. And uh, upon completion of your uh, comments, we'll ask you, Doctor, to comment about it from the standpoint of uh, the spiritual or the sociological, OK? OK. All right, Vince, what about the status quo economically? Well, economically, Bill, agriculture has been stagnant uh, since 1951. And that's a long time for uh, an important sector of the American economy to stand still. Now, in the concept of the economics that we're teaching and using in the United States today, uh, this is not all bad. Actually, the farm economy has never earned as much net income in the years from 1951 to date as it earned in 1949 or it earned in the average of 1947 to 49. Mm -hmm. Now, it's an important part of the American economy, and it is a large sector of the American economy. Yes. But it has been used in recent years to balance the rise in other sectors of the economy because it's largely unorganized and incapable of pricing its production such as the manufacturing industries do. As a consequence of this, it has contributed substantially, the economic factors, to the, the decay of the rural community and the scenes that you uh, preceded this film. Uh, it's something that I can't be optimistic about in the future because, in my opinion, before this changes, the power structure of the United States, starting at the presidential level, must completely change their economic point of view. It must recognize that the farm economy must have the same economic viability and increase in prices and profits that all other sectors of the economy have. And in failing to do this, the rural economy uh, neither supports itself nor does it support the other areas of the economy that depend on it as a market for mm -hmm. goods and services mm -hmm. that we use in our various businesses and particularly in farming. Now, there's nothing at the present time being done, to my knowledge, to change this philosophy. And the basic philosophy is very simple, that the agricultural economy must make a contribution to the total economy annually through relatively cheaper raw materials, which comprise uh, the basic uh, cons uh, elements for our food, shoes, clothing, beverages, mm -hmm. and tobacco, which consumes a substantial part of the earned income of the people of the United States. Now, the theory is, of course, that only 5% of the people suffer because this is the farm population today and 95% of the people benefit. But it ignores the fact that the farm economy is the rural industry. It's important to the rural community, the rural small town, and the rural city, such as Sioux City and Omaha, and even Chicago. Mm -hmm. Because the money that is generated on the farm is the source of subsequent business in the communities and in the service centers in the large cities. Without a generation of adequate income, at the farm level, which must uh, be generated by the farmer himself, this income cannot flow to the rural community and then beyond that into the metropolitan areas and into the manufacturing areas. Now, this is, uh, this is comparable to the wage, uh, the wage uh, payments that are earned from industrial development. Now, we're suggesting in rural America that the, that the solution to our uh, declining rural economy, which is really a declining price level and profit level more than anything else, that we substitute manufacturing enterprises, which is uh, fine. I have no uh, fight with this idea. But we cannot substitute anything for a prosperous farm economy. We must have in the rural economy, whether we have 3 million farmers as we have today or 100,000 farmers, we must generate a certain given proportion of the total national income of the United States. And failing to do this, we do not have the new wealth which will perpetuate the other areas of the economy and make it possible 
to trade effectively between the various areas. Now, what I'm saying is that when the product of an hour of labor in agriculture will trade for the product of an hour of labor in industry, we have equity of trade, and we can have approximate full employment, we can have uh, approximate full consumption, no troublesome surpluses, and we can have prosperity in agriculture as well as in the other sectors of the economy. Now, the rural areas, had it earned during this period of 1951 through the present period, the same average income, relatively, as was earned in other sectors of the economy, would have had twice as much money in the banks in the state as mm -hmm. in the nation as it has today. And as a consequence of this, the banks would have had the capability of loaning twice as much money, obviously. Also, we would have had to contribute twice as much capital. Yes. But the money, the bulk of it, you understand, would belong to the people. And when people have twice as much money, they have a tendency to do spend or invest twice as much. Now, this, to me, is the thing that we must have some restoration of, is the economic basis for a viable rural America before we can really accomplish the things that we're ambitious to accomplish in restoring uh, agricultural America mm -hmm. and rural America. Now, the thing I think, Bill, that is important here is the fact that while we want a viable and a, and a growing and a, a renewal of our agricultural economy, and while we probably have the people remaining, the hard core who hasn't moved out yet mm -hmm. or, or who have enough uh, business uh, capital to remain for a while, unless we can support any kind of economic advancement that we make after we have made it, it will die on the vine just as the advancements of the past mm -hmm. have died on the vine. Now, you can see in most rural communities where the principal small community in the area has leached away the business people of the other smaller communities outside of it. And now these communities that had the benefits of the people uh, from the smaller communities are losing their people to the next larger communities mm -hmm. as this process of leaching the business people out of these small communities persists and continues. Now, I agree that there can be a way, there is a way, I'm sure, of reversing this situation and of bringing to rural America the people who are looking for quality living and opportunity. I think that this has begun in a small way as the people get tired of the problems in the city and the things that are going on there that we all are so fully aware of. The fact of the matter is, uh, you've had an example or two in uh, your town of, right. of this returning to the smaller community, have you not? We have, and these people, as they come back, uh, are the graduates from the university who have gone into the Air Corps or gone into other areas uh, of the United States and the metropolitan areas particularly, uh, who have, for one reason or another, through retirement or for some other reason, decided to come back. Uh, most of the cases, uh, it's because they don't like what they have run into in the mm -hmm. metropolitan areas and because they want to continue to or finish bringing up their families in this rural surrounding that they themselves mm -hmm. were born and reared in. And as a consequence of this, we are getting some renewal of ideas, uh, people who are not satisfied with the status quo, yes. as you put it, and uh, who are making suggestions. But our principal industry, and we have to remember this, is the agricultural industry. We, in my opinion, do not need other types of manufacturing industry unless it's a processing industry where we process our own raw materials mm -hmm. before we ship them out. But as far as bringing some other type of manufacturing industry in where we have to bring the raw materials in and then ship them out, uh, I don't believe we need this. If we have an honest-to-goodness program at every level of government and business to see that the agricultural economy has a fair share of the income of the total economy. Now, some economists will call this uh, a redistribution of the wealth. I call it reflation of farm prices, reflation, because they have been deflated deliberately, in my opinion, and I think the record proves this, for the purpose of following this economic model of uh, reducing farm prices a little bit every year so that other people in the other areas of the economy will have more real income with which to buy other goods and services. Now, this is terribly detrimental to the rural economy it's deadening to the future of rural America, and I would say at the moment I'm extremely pessimistic about a turnaround uh, unless we have uh, some real talent come into the uh, arena and, and mm -hmm. help us a great deal. Do you think that this talent has to come into the arena, to use your phrase, at uh, the level of uh, government, federal government, Vince? Uh, yes, I think uh, some part of it has to be federal government. Hopefully uh, not. 
but the federal government has the means of controlling farm prices. And farming is a unique industry in that the grain we produce, the wheat, the corn, the milo, we have to produce a 365-day supply and put it in our granaries and cribs at harvest time in order to feed society the succeeding mm -hmm. year. So as a consequence, we have here a, a real serious handicap in agriculture because we've only got one day's available demand. It's my opinion, Bill, that unless some organization comes forward to enforce the needs of rural America upon the government, that the government isn't going to be the strongest uh, uh, force involved mm -hmm. in, in the renewal of rural America or in the restoration of the farm income situation. And I think perhaps that this is where the National Farmers Organization fits into the picture, and it needs uh, plenty of help from rural business people and others in order to force the government to see this point of view and not use the agricultural economy for the benefit of the other sectors, yes. but use it to support the other sectors. Do you remember Dr. Mueller? I certainly do. Hi, Doctor. Do you remember us? Yeah, I've been listening to you. For goodness sake, we've uh, <laughs> sort of ignored you and certainly uh, haven't intended to. Uh, I'd like for you now, if you will, Doctor, to comment on the status quo of the American agricultural community sociologically, and then go ahead and look into your crystal ball and tell us what you think uh, it lies ahead. Well, Bill, today we hear a good deal about the urban crisis. And I would say the urban crisis is very real, and we need to take that seriously. But to the same degree, there is a rural crisis, and this rural crisis has existed a long time and exists in many areas. It's a very complex thing. It is not just it's an economic crisis, as Vince has indicated. In a sense, it's a crisis of contradiction. Here we are, a people who the best fed people in the world, and yet we have uh, so many farmers who are not receiving two thousand, more than $2,500 a year. Mm -hmm. And we just haven't been able to, to, to lick this economic problem, as Vince has been discussing. But it's also in the area of education, in this sense that we produce some of the best young people, but then we can't afford them, and we send them off, it's this lead, created leadership off. It's a crisis of health. We ordinarily, I think in terms, you know, that... Uh, that we have less accidents in the country, but we have more accidents per capita in the rural areas than we have in the urban areas. But we have less doctors, less pharmacists, and less nurses and the like. And so you see, it's a crisis of contradiction. But beside this, it's a crisis of, of apathy. See, people are really uh, becoming discouraged in the sense that they have lost, they feel they have lost the control of their own destiny. They know something is happening to them, that they know that things are changing, their communities are changing, the economy isn't there, and they just feel that this is happening to them, and they don't have really any control over it. And it's a, it comes back to giving them the moral encouragement that there is an answer. And I think this has been suggested. The answer lies in people, as I'll get to a little bit later. And uh, But it, tied with this, I like to also say it's a crisis of, ir, of what I call adult irresponsible behavior. Now, this, let me illustrate this. You see, sometimes... Uh, when a certain group tries to improve a certain thing, then other groups tend to undercut them. See? And instead of just sitting idly by and letting them try it, they deliberately seem, seem to sabotage the common good. And now the same thing is here if a processing plant wants to come into a small community, and which I think we need more of to process more of the agricultural products near at home, then too often local citizens act irresponsible in the sense they don't want them to come in because it may raise the wage scale. And, uh, and then there's a lack of, a, of a, it's aggravated, this crisis is aggravated by a lack of integrity. You know, it's very difficult to get the farm story. You, uh, it isn't that anybody is telling an untruth, but no one is really telling the whole truth. See? Now we have seen this tremendous adjustment that is taking place, and the number of people that are still going to be leaving rural America. And uh, we hear the economic aspect of it, but we don't really zero in on the community problem because after all, the base of the economy is not just to provide food and fiber for the other sectors, but the base of an income is also to provide the basis of a quality living community. And uh, this needs a lot of thought. Then there is this crisis of communication. A, a rural America is organized vertically, and that there is communication from the small village to the next higher village, to the county seat, to the state, to the nation. Mm -hmm. 
but there is very little communication, what I call horizontal communication, that the towns on the same geographical area within a radius of 50 miles have the same thing in common, that they talk with each other. They tend to really compete with each other. And uh, this all adds to the, the confusion, the apathy, and the, the, the total the crisis. And it comes back to a really a matter of inadequate values. The economist has pointed out, I don't remember, you probably know him, Dr. Vince Brewster, who passed away a number of years ago. And he emphasized that the uh, agriculture policy has been determined by three basic creeds. The one is the democratic creed, which briefly stated is this, that no one is so wise that he can tell me what to do. And the farmer believes this. Rural people believe this. And it's good. Then there is the private enterprise creed, that no one is going to interfere in my business, not my neighbor, not my farm organization, or my government. And then there's the proficiency creed, that he has status among his peers if he can produce more mm -hmm. bushel per acre than his neighbor can. And there he's caught in these values. And the more he produces, the less he gets. What I find lacking here is not that these creeds are wrong, but there are, there's something lacking. And that is what I would like to call the creed of fulfillment. See? And that is that the strong ought to help the weak, as we talked about last week. Yes. And that uh, the more managerial ability God gives me or gives someone else, the greater my responsibility to help the people of less managerial ability to also find fulfillment. Mm -hmm. It ought not to be my role to use my superior training or education or skills to take advantage of those with less opportunity. So you see, this is a really a complex crisis. Yet I would say I see a ray of hope today, because I think there's something happening on the on the scene. We are we're finding uh, new leaders, and we're finding people really beginning to organize themselves. And I encourage different types of farm organizations, if they will really stand for some principles and stick with what they believe, so that they will balance their self-interest and their group interest. But I'd like to sort of put into focus at this particular point, if we have time, is what I see emerging, and that I would like to describe as the area community, the larger community. And that is uh, the same thing that we had years ago, but it's a different, on a different scale. And we might put it this way. We need a new type of neighborliness. See, we had neighborliness years ago in the, uh, among the, in the, in the small neighborhood. The barn burnt down. The neighbors got together and right. they had to run and, mm -hmm. and they, they helped each other. And, uh, or it was in the thrashing ring, or it was if a man was ill. This is still being done, but it existed between people, a, a closely knit people, often ethnic groups. Yes. But now this same spirit of neighborliness that existed between people that were close to each other needs to exist between the different towns that make up an area community. And a town of, a, let us say, a thousand ought to ask itself, what kind of a neighbor are we to our neighboring town? See? Are we a helpful neighbor, or do we see our neighboring town as a competing force? Now, I'm not against competition, but uh, th th it also has to be of the type that help each other. And uh, so I think what's on the horizon, when you see this, when you uh, begin to be examine the behavior patterns of people, their com shopping patterns, their commuting patterns, and people in the, in the non-metropolitan areas live in many different types of communities. For instance, here may be one that person that has a convenient shopping center, there's going to be 500, and he has a partial shopping center, or perhaps 1,000, a complete shopping center, perhaps the county seat town. Then he has his wholesale retail <coughs> shopping center. And then we have our athletic center, which for this area probably is the twin. I don't know which is, that's right or not. But what I'm trying to say is that we reside in a certain spot but we really live in the area, see? and we have interaction with, with this whole area. And now this, uh, for instance, we have documented this. I know of a certain uh, town that may be 70,000. If you take the larger trade area, this would bring it, the, the, the population up to about 250,000. This really, in my mind, is a scattered city. See? If we could just remove the city limits see? and begin to have people think together, now I'm not going to do this, because we don't want to necessarily phase out the small town or get a mass a, a city. But we want to find a way how these <coughs> different units can be strengthened 
and how they can improve the quality of life and business in their little community, but in relationship to the area. And what we're really reaching for is a new model type of living. And this is what we're working at in the Sioux Falls area, in which really the Sioux Falls is an area of 80,000, and if we include the surrounding counties that sort of polarize around this city, we come up with a, a scattered city of about 258,000. See, this brings together enough resources, both human and economic, that it is within our reach to have the quality of life second to none. And it is our hope that this will make possible to have the best of the big city, the best of the medium-sized city, the best of the small town, and the best of the open country. I buy the point that Vince made that we need a sound farm economy. But I think in addition to that, we will also be needing an additional source of income and this could come, I would say, from uh, the development of industry in the larger area community, mm -hmm. particularly the type of industry that will be processing the agricultural products. The products that are produced in the rural areas ought to be processed near the place of production. But in addition to the sound economy, there's another ingredient that I want to emphasize very briefly, and I think in the last analysis, whether rural America will come out of this and there'll be a renewal and there'll be quality living in the countryside, will depend upon the spirit of the people that are now living there. It will call for a type of people who are ready to accept responsibility, who are willing to work together with their neighbors, who are forward-looking, have a positive attitude, and are not afraid of the word planning. They'll think in terms of planning together, their own business, their own affairs, but also on a larger community basis. This, I think, would make it possible for us to come up with a new model type of community in the non-metropolitan area. Sitting between a preacher and a banker isn't so bad after all. Thank you. Vince, I'll be by for a loan. Very okay? good. Yes, sir. We'll save it. And, uh, Doctor, you can put in a good word with your man for me, if you will. I will. Our guests today discussing the future of American agriculture, and they were my guests last week discussing the past and present of American agriculture. On my left, Mr. Vince Rossiter. Vince is the president of the Bank of Hardington in Hardington, Nebraska. On my right is Dr. E.W. Mueller, one of America's outstanding rural clergymen. Until next week, at this same time on U.S. Farm Report, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.